Welcome to Martial Wisdom. Here you can listen to conversations on all kinds of topics related to martial arts. In today's discussion, we're going to talk about the importance of grappling for any martial artist. Joining me in this discussion is Brandon Needham. Before we start, I want to share something I'm very excited to announce, and that is my Spirit Aikido online program now has over 200 videos in the library. In the most recent video set, I've released a series on the self-defense entry for Aikido practitioners. These entries use movements which every Aikido practitioner is familiar with. What I share in these videos is a way to apply them in a way that's very useful for self-defense. If you'd like to support the show, please consider subscribing to this online program. There's a lot of content I know you'll enjoy. Another option is to contribute any amount you like through the PayPal tip jar. Even small contributions are greatly appreciated. I hope you enjoy this episode. Now, on with the discussion. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, I want to welcome Brandon Needham back to talk about grappling. Um, this is something that I think is almost a, a source of division among martial artists that, that have a view that wrestlers, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, e even some of the more ground-based grappling arts tend to be kind of brutal and savage, and they, and they kind of turn their nose up at it. And I think that's something we need to kind of get over. Um, and so welcome back, Brandon. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I think this is going to go in some unexpected places. Uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And I think this is for any martial artist who is considered, and I think all of us have, what, what effect does grappling or the possibility of having to deal with somebody who grapples or that you are either taken to the ground or are just pinned up against something and you're being smothered. Um, a lot of martial arts tend to need some space to work. And grappling, it's kind of a uh, a feature of grappling is it takes a lot of that space away and therefore can take a lot of a, a lot of effectiveness away from many different types of martial arts that that do need that space right um so brennan your your background uh you're now a jujitsu guy what what do you have uh, back further in your your martial background um well when i was younger i started with the traditional karate i did shotokan for quite a while mm -hmm. um did judo for a little bit in my younger years, um, but at the time I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. It just was not something I liked. I didn't like getting thrown mm -hmm. and like people jumping on me on the ground. It was just, I didn't like it. Sure. Um, and then from there I progressed to Aikido mm -hmm. um, and I've done Aikido for 25 years. Um, it's obviously the one art that I've done the longest and probably the one that I hold dearest to my heart. Um, but when I moved from Western Washington, I moved to Eastern Washington and over here, uh, there was no Aikido and I wanted to do something um, to keep my skills up at least a little bit. And at the time there was no jujitsu, there was judo though. So I actually went back to judo and did that for like seven years. Mm. Um, but during that time I was goaded into teaching Aikido and I thought about it and then I didn't know if I should, but um, my judo instructor said, uh, hey, use my facility and we'll just do Aikido judo. And I was like, okay. So that's when I started teaching Aikido and started doing my thing with that. So I did both. Uh, and then there was a, a gentleman that came from, he's from Brazil. He trained with the Gracies exclusively. Uh, he's a fourth degree, well, maybe fifth degree now. Um, and he just got promoted to fifth in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I started training under him. He was a great guy. Um, kind of opened my eyes to a lot of different things. And that's kind of where I'm at. Um, sure. With the downturn of Aikido, especially in this area, there's just not a big demand for it. My student base dwindled, so I kind of just bagged it. Mm. Um, I do privates. I do private sessions with people. And sometimes some BJJ guys, when they get wrist locked by me on the ground. They're like, what was that? And I said, oh, it's just this crazy technique I like. And I show them. So it, it, it's been fun. It's been a, a much, um, it's just expanded me a lot um, with different things. Mm -hmm. And I think it might've even improved my Aikido to be perfectly honest. I've, I've heard that from a number of practitioners that cross over that they say that they what they bring from their Aikido improves their uh, smoothness on the, on the ground and with grappling and, the, and vice versa. 
Uh, right. And the, it's the, the grappling part from all the comments that I've heard and including my own grappling experience has improved my standing work. Um, yep. And that's, I think, maybe a good place to start with uh, kind of elaborating on the term grappling uh, because it's often misunderstood by by people that have not had some exposure to what what grappling is or what jujitsu is. Um, it even within one school of jujitsu, which is the Gracie jujitsu, it has gone through an evolution in time. Even right. even with it being a, new, a fairly new art, um, what it is right now really is not what it was back when it it came to prominence. Um, right. You know, all arts evolve. Uh, and some not in a right. good way. You know, there's even some concern from uh, Hicks and Gracie about how that their own family art has evolved into a sport art and has lost a lot of its martial um, focus. And, yeah. and, and uh, part of that is, is the amount of standing and takedown ability. So yep. I guess a good way, a good way, place to start would be to define grappling. And to me, uh, without going to a, you know, the Wikipedia or, or some dictionary, is to say that if you may have and maintain contact with another person, that basically is grappling. Whether right. you're at arm's length distance and you're, you're keeping contact, and this is why I think Aikido could be described as a grappling art, because you mm -hmm. are actually maintaining contact and connection with the other person. The same way judo is kind of a grappling art even though the focus there tends to be on throws. I know Aikido has plenty of its own throws. Then you get into things that have closer contact, such as catch wrestling, uh, Greco-Roman, <clears throat> uh, the typical American wrestling, or, or you know what they call, uh, what is the term for it? Um, not professional wrestling, but um, like the show stuff, but competitive wrestling, right? Um, where you get a lot of body-to-body -body contact you know, it's still standing. It's not just everything right. goes to the ground, which is yet another myth that, you know, whether it's even real fights that they all wound up on the ground or that fighters mm -hmm. are all, always get to the ground. You should, <clears throat> you have to know <clears throat> groundwork because every fight ends on the ground like that. <laughs> it's not true. Now, when you get clumsy people falling around, yeah, they're falling yeah. on the ground, they're tripping. You see, you know, all kinds of fights that, that are, look like, you know, two wildcats in the, in the, in a back alley going at it right. oftentimes they do end up on the ground but um but i think grappling encompasses many different ranges and aspects um it's not all just lay on my back and hook somebody with my feet and try to you know no. and, and I, I think universally there is a disappointment with the fact that grappling is often viewed that way by from the outside you know, and right. as I, Aikidoka, we've experienced how our art is viewed from the outside by people that don't <laughs> aren't exposed to it. They don't know the neat yeah. nuance, the details of it. You know, we're disappointed that we have so many representatives out there that show it in such a way that it does look ridiculous. You know, I think right. we can all all martial artists can agree. Like, I, I wish <laughs> people could see my art for what it really is, not for how it's perceived. Yeah. And that is, a, and you're absolutely right with uh, Aikido being considered grappling. I've always considered it grappling. Um, I know there's there's different uh, phases mm -hmm. of fighting, and you know, punching, kicking, mm -hmm. throwing, grappling, all that. There's there's just different ranges, like Bruce Lee said. Mm -hmm. You know, he went through all the ranges and tried to find what worked for him. Um, right. Yeah, Aikido. Um, I love Aikido. I am upset at how it recently, especially the last five, 10 years, even, um, even teaching, I've had a number of students come, but then I've had a number of students go and inevitably I've seen a lot of them go towards jujitsu. And I'll give jujitsu some credit. They're good marketing. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. Jesus, you know, uh, the fight on the ground thing that always amazes me. Now, my previous life, I was law enforcement for 22 years mm -hmm. and when I would fight someone, inevitably we would go to the ground almost all the time, not every time, but almost all the time. Mm -hmm. And the basis of that is to get them to the ground so I can handcuff them because I'm not going to stand there and scroll around with somebody. Right. You know, yeah, unless I have to, unless they're up against the wall or somebody something. and then cuff them. Then it yeah. To, yeah. So that's where I come from. But mm -hmm. I think statistically, and I just read this, you know, they, they say, uh, they used to say 90% would end up on the ground. And I think legitimately it's 30 to 45%. Okay. actually end up on the ground i think that's the i just read that i 
need to be fact checked on that. Sure. Um, but I think that's the actual percentage. And that's even including one person going to the ground, not both. Not both, right. Um, and I don't know anybody that wants to go to the ground willingly, if, especially if there's more than one person around. You're going to get kicked, you're going to get hurt right. um, by other people. That's just, that's reality. Right. Um, so I think that the Gracies marketed their art really great, you know, and then they showed it in the UFC one and, mm -hmm. and that took off. But and that, um, that was a brilliant marketing stroke right there. Oh, the whole thing absolutely. Was, was yeah. Um, um, you know, and, and this is actually something that I'm glad you brought up because within, and I remember watching the old UFCs. Uh, kind of come along and I, I kind of I watched the first few and then sort of lost mm -hmm. interest in it came back watched them later um, but they they did go through an arc where you mm -hmm. know in the first few the the Gracies dominated um, and which was fantastic then there came the ground and pound as a counter to how do we how do we overcome this Gracie approach of basically the boa constrictor where you you know get yeah. somebody on the ground wrap them up and 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 choke them and and so the ground and pound evolved and there's one fighter in particular that i remember being incredible at stopping because then it evolved into what what overcame the ground and pound you know which was good striking mm -hmm. but within there within that frame there was chuck liddell who <laughs> did an amazing job of not being able to be held down to the ground so that he could be pounded and right. he he used, as I understand it, a wrestling approach to turn around, uh, be, having somebody on top of him, using uh, you know solid movement and structure, so that when he got up, he was always in a strong position, so that he could never be retaken to the ground. And it was, I, I've since tried to look very recently for some footage on it. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it looks like YouTube has kind of stripped a lot of the the videos or made them hard to find the actual full fights where yeah. you get a lot of highlight videos that that show all of his knockouts and which he had some pretty notable knockouts too. He had a very unusual punching style, which was, yeah. he was criticized for, but it was still valid. It worked. Yeah. Um, but his ability to not be taken and held to the ground was amazing. And I never saw somebody else who seemed to be that well-versed in just getting back up when somebody was trying to hold them down. And I, I view that that is something that is a good skill set for an average person to have because taking somebody to the ground, we all know, is disorienting. It, it, you know, if right. you don't, if you aren't trained in it, you will be very much like a fish laying on a on a on a piece of land. You know, you're mm -hmm. you, you don't know what to do. You're panicking. Like that's a perfect opponent to have. Somebody who's yeah. freaking out. They have no idea what they're doing. They're way out of their comfort zone. You need to have an answer for that. And that's why I like what Liddell showed of how do you turn this around, get to the top and get back to your feet. Like to me, that's a crucial self-defense skill. And you don't need five years of grappling training in order to start being pretty good at that. I mean, right. now if Ken Shamrock is the one taking you down, <laughs> you know, you got problems, you know? Right, right, right. Um, yeah, there's, there's within reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, the, your, your average, you know, uh, maybe somebody who had played some football in high school or, you know, just had brothers and he was always tussling with them and, and tackling them and, and whatnot. Um, it doesn't take a lot of training to, to learn those skills and be comfortable to say, nobody is going to hold me down. Right. You know, even somebody who's bigger is not going to be able to hold me down because I know the right ways to move. Um, and funny, you, you, uh, you're talking about your experience in law enforcement. I had uh, one of my mentors who also was in law enforcement he said he saw one of the damnedest things. They arrested this guy and he was smaller than average, skinny dude. They brought him into the booking room. And during the booking procedure, for some reason, this guy just started to get uh, resistant. Like he didn't want to sit there and go through the booking procedure. And they tried to say, you know, sit down. And one cop went over to try to put him down in the seat. I think they were going to try to cuff him to the chair. And he was, he didn't move fast, but he just kept moving and this cop could not get him back in the chair and keep him there. And then a second officer came in. They couldn't hold him. A third one, a fourth one, a fifth one. And it's like, he says, not like this guy was that strong. He just knew how to move and change angles. And he said, it was like watching the, you know, kind of like a, a comedy. This guy just kept moving around 
and they, he always had a pretty solid base. He says, one of the damnedest things I've ever seen, you know, when he's got five, six cops that can't keep him in a chair, yeah. you know? Yeah. And he said that it was is funny to look at. I mean, yeah. honestly, I, I do it too. Um, right. But it's not fun being there when you have, because you have five people moving different ways. Mm -hmm. And that person's just slithering through. And right. Yeah. He says it was a combination of like he was wily. He, he never like moved really fast, but he was evasive. And he said, I don't, and I never, I never found out if he's got any kind of background and, and some kind of grappling art or something. He didn't look like it, but yet, you know, for, he said this went on for 20 minutes, 20 plus minutes, <laughs> you know, so, um, I, so it can be done. I think that, yeah. that it's not to say that, that grappling is some kind of a superpower, although it, it does kind of feel that when you, when you have that experience of having somebody really try to physically dominate you and you can just calmly move to get to a, get back up or get to a superior position. So then you can get up. It does feel, feel super powery. Yeah. Um, which is really kind of kind of a neat thing, but of course we know in reality it's not. Right, right, right. Yeah. But what um, grappling does do, and I'll give everybody that does any type of jujitsu, wrestling, even judo, um, it gives you a, a little bit of confidence, and it lets you realize that the the stress level it, it stresses you out doing it, so that if you are confronted, your stress level doesn't get to the point where it might normally if you didn't have that experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that's my personal opinion. And that's what I've experienced. Because when I started doing jujitsu before that, I didn't have that type of um, fear of getting smashed or somebody all over me. Mm -hmm. And when I got in tussles in law enforcement, um, my adrenaline was, was way up there. Um, sure. And I could feel the dump. I mean, I was, shouldn't have been sweaty and, and mm -hmm. exhausted the way I was, but I was absolutely, you know, exhausted after a tussle a small minor tussle mm -hmm. but after jujitsu i'd say after about six months to a year in um it really changed my um physical reaction to a situation yeah and it helped with my aikido it did and it made yep. me realize certain things and body movements mm -hmm. and how to deal with it in a, in a less stressful way mentally mm -hmm. um as well as physically so you know a tussle before versus after, I, I can see there's a mile long difference between how I would have reacted versus how I did react and you know, control the situation. It's funny you mentioned that because I had the same thing. The very first time I started getting into grappling and groundwork, and we, we kind of took a, a wrestling approach because uh, I was working mm -hmm. with, with somebody who had a very strong wrestling background uh, who was also a police officer. So he modified his grappling to be useful in a not so much a sport yeah. type of of a application but in like restraint and survival mm. um and the first boy that first few months i just felt totally i didn't even know i could have been on you know the service of mars i just it was like a whole <laughs> different realm um, and it felt clumsy moving around you know i kind of it kind of felt like i originally felt with aikido where you, mm -hmm. you know what foot do i move i always felt like just everything is going a different direction uh, but on the ground, you're laying down. Now you have the disorientation of not even being in a normal stand-up, you know, type thing. And and I was right. scrambling. I was trying to use strength and speed. And of course, I was going fast somewhere. I didn't even know where I should be going. I was just going there fast, trying to think. Well, you know, probably moving quicker is better than moving slower. You know, type all the new the newbie type uh, right. traps you you fall into. And then something happened right around the about eight month mark is I started realizing that moving explosively is a waste of time and effort and will be an advantage to your opponent, not to you. Yeah. And that you, you know, when you get taken down, you should almost feel like a, a gator sliding into the water. Like that's yes. your realm. You calm down, you slow. There's no use. There's no reason to go fast. And there's no reason to use a lot, you know, strength because both of those will burn you out really fast. And so that yeah. calm, you kind of let it wash, wash over you. And it, it's so palpable when you start to feel that, oh, I know where I'm at. I know where my opponent's at. Yeah, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a not great position, but I know what to do from here. And it just mm -hmm. becomes like a mechanical practice. It's not right. an emotional one. It's a, you know, mental calm. Here's what I have to do to get out. It's going to be, it might be kind of rigorous, but you, you keep your mind calm. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that that's, it was one of the greatest, uh, experiences enlightening 
that I had about, you know, dealing with an extreme stress situation is the importance of maintaining calm. And then when I started teaching, you know, guiding my students through it, uh, you know, with this, this person's help, that really, that really get, got them to a mind place of, oh, I'm not helpless when I get somebody bigger on top of me. I know what I'm doing. Right. And I know the importance of, of going, okay, I'm on the ground, take a breath, everything slows down now, things work at a different pace. Um, and I think that's crucial. I think every martial artist should, should know how to do that. I agree, 100%, yeah. Like it's probably one of the most profound experiences I've had as, as a martial artist, because it's, there's such a mind thing going on there. Um, and, you know, back when I was competing, uh, when I was younger, I, I was pretty fast. So I would often use speed. And, you know, until I ran across either a fighter who was faster than I was, or one that was new timing better. He wasn't yeah. faster, but I couldn't, I couldn't outspeed him. Yeah. And, you know, I thought, man, I'm burning up a lot of energy, especially when I compete where it was really hot or humid, and it was, you know, <laughs> miserable. And right. effort takes, takes it out of you much quicker. And I'd yeah. see somebody be like, they're not even look like they're working hard, you know, and, and that's where a good grappler, you can see, they don't look like they're working hard because no. they're not, they're using efficiency. Yeah. It's um, a chess game. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, and, and I see that from, you know, top level judoka, um, mm -hmm. you know, it looks less like Olympic wrestling, which is explosive and powerful and, and, you know, heavy duty athleticism. And then you get, you know, your Cusa Mifunes and the people that have been doing it that have that calm mindset, you know, they're, they're undisturbed and, but yet you can't ever get to a position of advantage on them. Right. You know, and, and that's where I think Aikido, um, is very related to, to all grappling. Cause like we said earlier, it really is a grappling art. And I think there's a gap in there of, of understanding that there is a lot of traditional jujitsu that is stand as standing art. And I know a lot of people say, oh yeah, I know that Aikido is a, a, a type of jujitsu, but you ask the average person and they think jujitsu is guys in rash guards on the ground and Aikido is guys, you know, in Hakama standing up like that's, yeah. There's a lot in the spectrum. Right. Well, there's there's uh, ground stuff in Aikido. Yeah. You just have to do it mm -hmm. and learn it. Right. Um, well, I'm not saying you're going to be, you know, some mm -hmm. UFC star using groundwork from Aikido, but there's pins and there's stuff. You know, I've I've actually wondered if there wasn't truly some Neiwaza work that O Sensei had that just never made it, you know, to yeah. modern day. And, and there were a few photos that have emerged, you know, the right. around, but uh, yeah, you're right. I don't know if there was any real curriculum that came about. Of course, yeah. there's always a question with those sensei, like what was a curriculum? Because he didn't, <laughs> as a teacher was not organized. Um, no, it was it just like a lot of times he actually would, especially as time went on, he would delegate other people to teach. Right. And he kind of seemed content into just doing his own thing kind of when he wanted to. And so, right. Um, you know, and that, that's where I admire Tamiki and, and uh, I think Tohei did this. And there were a couple others that had teaching backgrounds that knew the importance of actually putting a curriculum together and, and organizing right. what gets taught. Um, and I think, you know, you see, obviously judo is at the top of that list of being a mm -hmm. very well-organized uh, curriculum. Um, you know, and it is funny how even now, and I just wanted to jump in with this one of the number of jujitsu people you know competitive jujitsu people that will still seek out judo because they don't have enough uh or, or they i shouldn't say not enough they have almost no takedown experience and they're like we right. need to go where the takedowns are and that's in the judo realm right um you know so i it's one of those things that you know we said earlier i said earlier about arts evolving and i think it, it, as modern jujitsu starts to narrow its focus because it's so interested in that heavy duty chess game that if they lose a big portion, which is takedowns now, you know, they, they will start to need to cross train and branch out. It's just sort of like a evolution of the art, I guess. Right. Or, yeah. De-evolution, I guess you'd call it. Right. Um, and I, you know, I think Aikido is in many regards, kind of in that same boat, we've hyper-focused on a little too much of one thing. I mean, I mean the we broadly, but you know, because there's those of us who have definitely been trying for some time to make sure that those holes did not exist, the big, right. you know, gaping holes. 
and that's the issue, you know, and, and people get real, um, what's the word? They, they get real protective of when they do Aikido and what people think of it. I do. Um, I wish people would, would see how Aikido is as far as a martial art, not how it's portrayed in a lot of ways um, by people, even well-respected instructors when they do demos and stuff. I, mean, I, I understand. I, I recently obviously have critiqued someone that kind of started a, a shit storm with uh, people yeah. protecting him. And I like him. I like the guy a lot. Sure. Me but too. when we see things like that, I know what it is. I totally do. And I know what he said. I get it. But people see that and that's their perception. Uh, this is a bunch of shit. I don't want to do it. They're just doing nonsense. They're, they're LARPing. And that bothers me because it's not LARPing. If you do Aikido, legitimate Aikido, right. it's anything but. Um, and you know that as well as I do. Oh, ab absolutely. You know, and there's, there's a place for, and I guess this is, this is where I have to applaud the Gracies for having managed their image so well by specifically choosing what to show and what not mm -hmm. to show of how they got to where they are. And, right. I, and I think that there's one ingredient there um, that jujitsu has. And I think, and I know that this is the case. A lot of people that, that have pursued, wanted to pursue a more active and vibrant martial art have gone to jujitsu because they have a live element to the training that's fun. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's a fun thing to be able to go and, and play. You're not trying to kill each other, right? As much as you're trying to figure out the physical, you know, movements and counters techniques and apply them in a, in a free form type of thing. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I know a lot of Aikidos will say, well, you know, Aikido's got Randori too. And like, well, that's kind of, that's in the brochure, but I've found when I ask people, how often does your dojo train Randori or do it? I've gotten most of the large variety of the answers where we don't do it at all, or, or sometimes we'll do it maybe once a year or twice a year, or very rarely. Like, well, right. if that's where your fun part of the training is and you're not doing it, well, there's no wonder that, you know, you're not able to have that, that aspect of your martial art develop. Cause if you never practice it, you're not going to be good, any good at it. Right. Um, and course if you if that's the fun part of training and you don't do it very much what's the rest of it is that fun right. enough to keep students and yeah you know, that may explain and to, to the idea and i've heard this one too well aikido is so dangerous that you could not you can't train it live like like you would train grappling which i'm not quite buying that one um mm. i think that or that Randori needs to be toned down so much that it's kind of like a Giawaza. It's more of a movement drill. Right. Um, I don't think that that's true either. Now, granted, you don't have to go 100% and have Ukes trying to kill Nage, but you can definitely have Ukes who have the skill to move to move quickly and attack in such a way to make it challenging for Nage so that Nage can learn. Yeah. And um, one of the things that that I started doing was actually doing a, a one uke randori where i just say okay get nage you have you know 60 seconds to to attack him in any way you want to and dominate him and nage basically wins if he goes the minute without either getting controlled or gets control of uke and locks him up and pins him and yeah that's perfect you know and i've had success with white belts doing this by the way you know, I can have, in fact, I introduced it, put it on the yellow belt test, the very first test mm -hmm. for all my students. And they, they love it. They think that it's like, this is where the, your martial art, all the, the technical details you practice get put into an application. You know, if it was somebody learning guitar, it would be, they, they play a song, you know? Right. Um, yeah. And it doesn't need to be multiple attackers, although they like that yeah. too, which is, you know, kind of a different set of a rule, rule of engagement. But right. the idea that you're dealing with somebody who can, who's got the freedom and latitude to attack you any way they want to, and you can handle it, like that's that's a fun. That's you talk about that accomplishment, that feeling of, I've learned something. I'm I'm growing. I think right. that's really important. Oh, it is absolutely, and I, I don't think enough schools do that. And when they do randori, it's the Frankenstein attack where they have their arms extended and they just walk towards somebody and then they get thrown. Right. 
Right. That doesn't do anybody any good, in my opinion. I mean, right. yeah, it's nice to start that way with a beginner and just kind of show them how things work. But as soon as they progress beyond that, you know, they shouldn't, there should be no attacks like that, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and I've seen well, it with higher belts when they test, especially showing on tests. I've seen that. And I was, oh, yeah. what, what was going on right now? <laughs> you know, what, what is this? I don't understand this. Yep. Yep. And well, to put some credibility to your, to your opinion, and that, that is, and I, I was reading this in, um, I think it was the, the talent code. Um, and I forget the author's name, but talking about, about building excellence and skills. If you have somebody who is succeeding at whatever it is technique they're trying to learn, 100% of the time, they're not actually learning. They're outside right. the learning zone. They're just on cruise control, whatever. Right. If they fail most of the time, they're getting frustrated. They're not learning what they should be doing. If you're in about the 80% success rate, and about 20% you fail, you're failing enough that your brain can start to observe, all right, what is it that I'm doing wrong that's making this fail? But right. you're getting 80% right, so your body's starting to, to build that pattern. So the, uh, to me, the zombie arm thing is, well, we don't wanna have anybody experience failure. We don't wanna have any yeah. students frustrated by making a mistake. Well, if they don't make any mistakes, they're not learning. And so no, when, you, when you tone Randori down so much that everybody's succeeding, then yeah. you're wasting training time. Yeah. If, if they're not having a successful failure, then they're not succeeding. They're not going to succeed. And that's right. how I look at it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I understand sometimes people that only ran into one in my entire teaching career that just can't comprehend something, no matter what you do. Right. And I get that. Mm -hmm. but that's a minority, not a majority. Yeah. Extreme and, minority. Yep. Yeah. So, um, I think as a teacher, if they're failing more than anything and they're getting frustrated, like you said, I mean, that, that teacher needs to reevaluate how things are going and what they are in fact teaching, mm -hmm. um, because it's not helping anybody. Right. And, exactly. And, and I think for those people that, that will say, and I know a lot of Aikidoists that, that are of the, you know, I'm not in Aikido for self-defense. I'm, in it for self-development mm -hmm. those people i would say explore the ground some because if you're comfortable moving when you're vertical why wouldn't you want to be comfortable when you're moving horizontal exactly regardless of whether you're going to ever going to be in a fight that's on the ground right. and and i will say too that that i had a very unexpected benefit from learning the get up like the turkish get up where you roll onto your side and you roll up I had a lower back strain that I had a very hard time rolling out of bed. And then I used that Turkish getup where I rolled onto the side <laughs> and I was able to get up even with a very pronounced back pain. Like, yeah. I was like, wow, this is, this is like magical, you know? So right. the foreman getting up because it's so efficient that way, you know, can help you. It can just, it can, you know, and of course, Aikidoists, we get thrown to the ground all the time. We, mm -hmm. we, we become friends with the ground and right. that's often how I will, will, you know, uh, portray why we learn to ro roll and get up and, and get to the ground without getting hurt to reawaken our friendship with the ground that we always had when we were little, little kids. We did everything on the ground. We're crawling around yeah. on the ground. We're jumping, we're rolling, we're playing in the dirt. And then we get bigger and the ground represents fear it, because it's pain. You know, when you fall over, it hurts. And now you're like, I'm right. afraid of the ground. Like you, you get back over that. And so really that the grappling side is just becoming friends with how you can move on the ground and be mobile. And again, that's how I equate it to the Aikido. And I've, I've always felt that Aikido, Judo, and Jiu Jitsu are, and even Sumo are like all brothers from the same father oh, in absolutely. so many, so many regards. Um, but the idea that, that whether it's, you know, you're comfortable maneuvering on the ground or you just say as a martial artist, I, I don't want to ever be taken out of my comfort zone. So I'm going to make my comfort zone so big that, I'm never going to be out outside of it or right. it's going to be very rare that somebody could take me outside of where I'm comfortable. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I think it's important to train in both areas. If, yeah, if you're absolutely. really worried about self-protection and mm -hmm. self-defense. Yep. Um, and jujitsu is, is interesting, you know, but they're, uh, I love it, but I also like arguing with some of them because they, they have this narrow view of their own history. And I'm like, guys, you're doing modified judo. I mean, this is, let's be honest, it came from judo. They modified the groundwork and specialized in it, but it's modified judo newaza. Yeah. And judo came from traditional, a few different traditional jujitsu systems mm -hmm. when 
uh, Professor Cano would put them all together. Mm -hmm. So, right. you know, they they think they're a part of this jujitsu general art thing, and that's I, I agree it is to a degree, but it's not really jujitsu if you're going to look at it in terms of history. Right. Um, yep. I mean, I, I guess in a way it is if you're looking at lineage through the the centuries, but yeah. um, it's just specialized judo. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I know that, and I accept that. I don't care. I mean, it, it's great. I love it. Yeah. Um, and it, I encourage everybody to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. I did a keto for so long, but I also, and I hate saying this, became fat doing it. <laughs> and I was 325 pounds before I started jujitsu. Wow. And now I'm 260. Okay. Um, and I've maintained that weight. I'm six seven, so my weight is kind of big boy. Yeah. Good for my my size, but it legitimately helped me. And I encourage people to really get into it. And then it made me think, well, what is wrong with Aikido? Because I sweat sometimes when I did it. Why wasn't I losing weight? And then I realized, well, it wasn't the intensity. And right. the, the, yeah, because grappling is extraordinarily cardio. difficult to, yeah, to do. It's, and it's, and I, I almost wonder if Aikido is probably one of the worst arts for having, I hate to say this, just lazy practitioners. You can go right. in, you can do an hour and a half without breaking a sweat, depending on how the teacher and you are, how the teacher's running the class and how you take on practice with your partner. Right. Um, you know, I've, I've practiced with people that like to chat more than they like to do reps. Um, you know, they like, yeah. oh, you're sweaty. Like, this is a martial <laughs> arts class. You know, I'm thinking, I want to do reps when I get in there. Right. I want like, let's, let's make this work. I'm not here to chat about, you know, motorcycles or whatever. I'm here to, I'm here to train. Like, if I do, if I do a class, I would like to come out with, you know, 200 reps, not 20. Because it's, you know, what's going to waste your time. But, um, but, but I agree. I've seen a lot of Aikido practitioners that look like they're in horrible physical condition. Yep. And, you know, that, that alone says something about the art as, cause we're all, every practitioner is an ambassador of their art. Right. You know? And I get that there are some people that are, you know, old, they've had knee replacements, hip replacement, you know, Absolutely. but then they still do Aikido. And I applaud, I applaud them for that. Absolutely. But I also think that not everybody's in that boat where they have, you know, fuse discs in their back or some reason that they can't actually move around and stay in decent shape, like have a martial artist body. Right. Um, you know, it's, it, and I, I do admire the efficiency part too, where you don't have to be athletic to move around, which is great, but you don't want to get to that point where your performance envelope is really narrow because right. you know, you're way overweight, your knees get bad. Um, you know, because you're overweight, human bodies are not designed to carry that much weight. Correct. And so yeah. it'll, it'll, it'll take it out on your body. And so it you know, I've always found it's ironic for those people that practice um, Aikido for their health and for their well-being and for their growth. And they've neglected the health threat that is, you know, their diet and exercise and the other right. things that I, like everybody knows about. You know, I find that kind of funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I've seen people train hard and then they go get McDonald's and I'm like, right. Okay. I mean, <laughs> that's probably the worst thing to put in your body right now, but whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, you know, and I mean, everybody can, can get something out of it. I mean, I have students that are, you know, very, very old and you don't expect them to, to, you know, move at the same level as somebody who's 30, you know, or 25 right. years old, but you just don't, but uh, you can tell when somebody has when they go out of their way to take care of their body and their safety even the people that, that do their martial arts for self-defense like i want to protect my body well, like why well, are you protecting it from yourself because of right you know your own habits are are part of the the threat of against yeah. your body you know yeah there's a totality thing where right. everything matters and yeah i don't think people quite acknowledge that i think people realize they just don't want to acknowledge it right um, right um, you know, but, and I found too, that, that like with my own Aikido, I do like the efficient part, the, the study of that, but I also do like just kind of cranking it up and, you know, moving and, and enjoying the athletic yes. aspect of it, breaking a sweat, you know, having the challenge of people grabbing you and you got to deal with it. Um, you know, the less you can, the quicker you can resolve it in a, in a, like fight situation. Absolutely. But within training, that's not the only 
aspect that you're focusing on. You do want to, you know, explore more challenging movement, more elaborate movement. Um, and that all is, it does take some athletics. I don't think there's a martial art out there that doesn't have an athletic influence. So. Uh, yeah, you know, there's, do. yeah, it's, um, I mean, the only one I can think of maybe would be like snipers, right? But you still have to have breath control. You still have to be in good shape. I mean, you can't just be, you know, Santa Claus and, <laughs> and you know, uh, <laughs> there's there's a lot to it but um but with any hand-to-hand -hand art i don't i just don't think there's a way you can think. rely on doing it and be a total you know physical wreck or or a yeah. cream puff you know it's, yeah I, I agree with you i mean you're it, you're yeah. exactly right yeah, yeah. and there's um, no way and i do think too that that you know a lot of people will look at grapplers and they go my god look at how muscular they are they're just massive um especially wrestling side because oh, yeah. almost all wrestlers are beefy. Like you don't get skinny wrestlers. I mean, no, um, but that doesn't mean that they aren't still focused on that efficiency um, right. and, and moving in such a way that you have the, the angle advantage and the leverage advantage on your opponent or on your attacker. And, you know, you got to realize too, that those people that look beefy, they do a ton of grappling. Like that's, they're they're doing heavy duty physical conditioning all week right. long. Yeah, and, and they're uh, doing weights and they're doing all sorts of things yeah. on top of just yeah. wrestling. I mean, there's exactly. And, and, and this is one of those things where you know it's easy to get into, even with with uh, sport type people, where you say, okay, well, this fighter they've got a like a kicking or and a punching background or whatever their background is, and they want to add grappling to it, and they're like, wow, they they pick this up and quickly. Well, we if you have a strong athletic body you can kind of, you can learn new things quite quickly, especially if mm -hmm. you've already gone through one martial discipline and you understand how to learn and adapt new things in. Um, but when is it ever a disadvantage being stronger than somebody else or being more physically fit in better, better physical condition? Like, right. you know, uh, and raw athleticism can actually prevail even in a, with a lack of skill. And this, Absolutely. you know, we talked a little bit with Tony Blauer in the, my last interview where you know there are people that have survived fights purely for the mindset that they had a focus not to be dominated and they were pretty athletic like they could mm -hmm. not slip and fall by taking a, a you know a step or you know something like that so um even without disciplined skill the physical fitness part is a is a component to survival um Absolutely. Yeah. And they can dominate people with skills. I mean, yes. there's no doubt about that. No. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So you add the skill to the mix and now you've got, you know, a good, well-rounded uh, set of, or ability to survive. And right. I think that, that the, the skill set part is being big enough to know those fundamentals of how to survive the ground. And those, yeah. if they're taught right, I think they can be done pretty easily in six to eight months. Um, oh, absolutely. And the only downside is if you get, for example, a, um, like a, a sport oriented martial artist yeah. doesn't really understand what that subset of survival is. And they want to get into the complicated sport specific things. Right. And that's, I love training with, with all kinds of people and I love training with grapplers, but I've had to sift quite a bit through to say, that's cool, but it doesn't really fit a self-defense or a survival type situation. Right. And it takes some sifting to kind of figure out what those, what those things are. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu schools have led to, is the yeah. sporting aspect. And I'm not saying that those guys probably couldn't handle themselves, because I'm oh, sure. pretty sure they could. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But that focus, much like it did with Judo, kind of hinders a lot of things that they do and and what their focus is i don't want to go in and learn this fancy rubber guard technique i want to go in and learn the basic fundamental jujitsu skills All right that are going to stay with me the rest of my life and help me um yeah. i'm fortunate that my instructor does both i mean he mm -hmm. came from gracie baja but he came from brazil and he teaches in the fundamentals especially their self-defense stuff is 
I like it. Take down. Well, as I understand it, and if he had, if he was fifth or sixth, Don, he probably started at the time when the, the Gracies. That's what they were focusing on are those fundamental yeah. parts. Yeah, they hadn't gotten into the heavy duty sport, right? Specific stuff yet. Yeah, um, and he's a world champion. I mean, he's done. He's got medals. He's competed. I mean, he's all about that too. But he's very focused. Sure. And I've noticed other schools are more focused on. Well, let's do this barambolo technique, and you're going to do this and. I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to go crazy. I want to learn. Basic you know, I'm stuff. glad you brought that up because it, it has always struck me that there's kind of, there's two types of martial artists. They're the ones, the, and this is the bigger group that are kind of always looking for the next gimmick technique or the, the new thing that they've not seen before, or, right. you know, they're always kind of looking for a shortcut. Um, and then there's the type like what you just described, and I'm the same way, I want to learn the bread and butter, because that's, it may not be sexy, but when you can do the bread and butter reliably, like that's what makes you survive. That's what, that's right. how you win. And that, it goes right back to my, you know, the com competitions that I used to do. It's not the guy that knows 80 different attacks. It's the one that knows two or three of them and does every one of them razor sharp. Like, yes, it's a threat when they bring this thing out, not because everybody doesn't know what it is, but they know how to set it up. They know the timing, they know the range, they control their movement perfectly or, or very well. They can read their opponent and know when that thing needs to go and yeah. they do it like that. That's what makes a competent martial artist, not yeah, the one that goes chasing person. gimmick techniques around and goes, oh, this is cool. Nobody's ever seen this because, you know, I've found that, um, it doesn't take that much for somebody to thwart a complex or complicated, intricate technique. Right. They're, they're pretty delicate. Now, in yeah. certain circumstances, that might be just the right thing you need, but you better know what those circumstances are and not apply it at the wrong time. Because right. as we know, any technique done at the right time is the right technique. Right. Any technique <laughs> done at the, any good technique done at the wrong time is the wrong technique. Right. And so the more the more I see people arguing about, well, this technique is better than that technique. And it's like it just shows where where your mind, what level your mind development is at. And you're, right. you're thinking on that. Is this the right gimmick or the wrong gimmick? And it just not the way to look at it. No, no, absolutely not. Yeah, no. that, those those people are very shallow and very narrow minded. Right. Um, in my opinion. And well, that's and, not and uh, yeah, I think and they kind of reflect a. a that they're novices you know they're they're not at that level yet they'll get there if they keep going and actually start discovering how to get beyond that level to go right. to the point where okay what are, what are the people that are really at the top of the game how do they do this and and i think this has inf affected instructors because they know that they will keep students and gain more students by showing them the gimmick and showing right. them more techniques new techniques um, as I understand it, uh, even Savat back in the 1700s went through this, where you had, you know, Savat was primarily uh, used by soldiers, or I shouldn't say soldiers, but sailors and, and street ruffians and thugs yeah. very effectively. And mm -hmm. then, you know, the aristocrats would go, oh, I want to I learn how to protect myself like that. So I'll pay you to come here and teach me, which, you know, they could do in probably two sessions or three sessions, but then they wouldn't be making any more money. Right. But then if they came back and said, well, I have something else to show you too next week. So they just keep coming back and they keep kind of making more. And, and um, as I understand it, uh, Ed Parker's uh, Kempo Karate went through kind of something similar where when he came back to America, he had, I think like, I don't know, 13 katas or something. And he, he mm -hmm. would teach all of his students, they were done and then they would quit. And he realized, well, they're quitting. So he started designing more and more katas. And I think there's like hundreds of them now. Probably, yeah. Uh, because, you know, if, if somebody, if a student is saying, well, I want to be here till I, I, I learn all the katas, I got to learn all of them before I can think of quitting. Well, now you've got a perfect marketing approach, yeah. you know, or a yeah. student retention. It's a business model more than it's right. a martial art model. So, <clears throat> and, and I, I, don't, I think every art can go through that very same thing. You know, it's just whether or not, you know, what techniques, what, what's your library of techniques? If you got a big library, it looks impressive and it takes longer for students while they are paying their tuitions to you to learn them all. Right. 
Um, so. I think Akita went through that and maybe it's still going yeah. through that a little bit to the, to the point of, um, I don't know a lot about Osensei's training students in like Boken work. I've done Boken work and mm -hmm. with Tosh and all that, but I've seen some instructors create and add more to their bow and, and, and Joe stuff mm -hmm. and stuff I've never People seen. Love weapons. weapons will attract students. Yeah. They were really like, I'm like, huh, so where did they learn all this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember seeing it. And I mean, I, I'm no master, but I would have at least heard of it before, I'm sure. Right. Um, so I, I think there's some stuff like that going on in, in every art, like you said. And, and Aikido is no different. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. That that bothers me. I, I, I like purity. And I guess, again, we can come back. What is pure Aikido? I mean, anybody's right. going to come up with a different answer. You know, I have heard that there's the, uh, although a sensei did use the Boken mm -hmm. thumb, I mean, we've seen films of it and whatnot, Yeah. but he didn't really have any formal training in the sword or any notable, notable training or influence, but yeah. he used it anyway. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. funny how uh, Aikido tends to see it as, you know, well, it's a samurai art, and it, you know, comes from the battlefield and these type of things like, well, if that was true, then where would the lineage of his sword work be? That you'd think there would be something in his lineage that would say, okay, right. this is where it was handed down, or you know, that's where he didn't just make it up. And you know, I, I remember hearing, listening to an uh, was a discussion by some some, and I wish I could remember their names, but they were uh, French. I think it was uh, uh, Erard uh, Sensei who was talking with a few other people. I could be mistaken on that one, but. They were talking about the uh, Iaido and uh, the, the sword schools and how they do Japanese sword. And they were, were looking at film of Osensei and what he was doing. And they say what he was doing really does not abide by any of the principles that we were taught of the Japanese sword. And right. what, what we are seeing is quite dubious in terms of, you know, effectiveness. And, and I guess that would, you know, we're kind of, diverging on a slightly different subject but, um but i think that that there's it's nice to have that image of the samurai you know the mm -hmm. hakama the 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 dogi the boken or the sword like it creates a great picture um and that picture may even attract students but it's what do you deliver that's modern and this is like and i and i relate this to the joe which is the joe was a tool of the time that was used by average civilians. And when samurai became average civilians, instead of being able to carry sword, they would use the walking stick. And that became a, uh, a tool that they just went to because it was available. Well, right. now we've got a different time. And, and to me, if Aikido can adapt to, to, the, to the times that it, it's, it's in, a better tool would be a, a, like a walking stick or a cane. Mm -hmm. And you could do it like a Joe type hiking stick. I've seen, you know, a couple people around with those, but they tend to raise a little bit more eyebrows unless somebody looks clearly elderly or something like that. Like somebody, a fit right. person like you walking around with a Joe might have some trouble. Plus the Joe is pretty long. It would be tough to get into a car with it um, or, you know, into a confined <laughs> space or even use it in a hallway or in a stairwell because it's, it's pretty big, but right. you know, a three foot, walking stick would be would fit in those areas very well could get in and out of a car with it and go pretty much anywhere you know with it and so you know it's it's interesting to see about because this kind of relates to the to how we how we would want to study the ground what would we want it for our times not 50 years ago but for you know for now um for a modern era and i think you know even people that don't have any martial experience or any have played any football have seen what a leg takedown can be or a tackle and to dump right. somebody on the ground like that's not that's not a, a, a complicated or intricate maneuver to, to pull on somebody and it's very effective when it when you land it mm -hmm. so you know dealing with those um and you know being able to to do it chuck liddell not let yourself be taken down or if you are taken down know how to get back to your feet i think that's a way to look at, at it right. in terms of a modern interpretation of what can we do 
that suits our modern era. Um, and, and I guess that's one of those things that separate the, are you studying a martial art for, for a modern application or are you studying this martial art as being some kind of a cosplay or a you know, role-playing type, type thing? Um, and I think some, some Aikidoists do dig the, the look and the feel more than they dig the, uh, you know, what, what am I, what is the application I'm using here? Right. Yeah. I think, uh, one, one thing to look out, look at, um, is like ground defense and recovery, mm -hmm. you know, um, if I can use that term, you know, sure. if you get taken down, get back up or try to get, mm -hmm. have techniques that can get you back up. You don't want to stay on the ground. Right. I mean, I do like, I like rolling and I love doing techniques and I love getting kimuras and chokes and arm bars. Mm -hmm. But if I'm being real, I don't want to roll around on the ground. I want to get up and get in an advantageous position mm -hmm. to either run away or stop the threat and mm -hmm. let, you know, police handle it or whatever's going on. Right. Um, or control the situation. That, that's the main thing is to control mm -hmm. the situation. I don't, I think people have this fallacy when they see UFC and stuff too. They're like, oh, so you can go to the ground, you can beat them and do all this stuff. And you're just going to get in trouble doing that. Right. Um, people need to be aware um, of the reality of what a ground fight really would be versus what they see on TV or what they're told. Right. So, um, yeah, I, my, my, my focus has always been try to get when I'm training, get in a, in a disadvantaged position or a bad position mm -hmm. and try to work out of it. Um, right. Especially with somebody that knows what they're doing, because if I can do it against somebody that knows what they're doing, I'm going to get out of it when somebody doesn't know what they're doing. That's not right. going to be a problem. Um, and I think that's another thing that bothers me with the, sometimes when people talk about UFC or ground fighting, mm -hmm. um, you're talking about a weight class and a rule set where people are in theory, skill the same but at least the same weight class mm -hmm. um versus reality where you could have a huge opponent or a small opponent i mean it could it could vary and their skill level can vary most of the time people aren't going to know something if they're going to fight you they're not going to be a true martial artist they're going to be some thug or mm -hmm. somebody doing wild stuff it's not going to be knowledgeable attacks right. not all the time but probably usually mm -hmm. um and i i I, that's my problem with Aikido too. You know, people think they can just do this magical hand waving stuff and that's going to throw someone or. Right. And that's where, that's probably where my problem with some demos now come from. Mm -hmm. I never had a problem with demos before, but I've really looked at things differently lately. And I'm just like, this is horrible. I don't right. like this. This is really showing us in a very bad way. Yeah. And people are going to tag me for that view. And I get that, but um, I don't care. I mean, that's my opinion. And you know, I want a keto to work and yeah, exactly. I'm adding things to it to make it work, whether it's on the ground and, you know, I do a keto on the ground. Mm -hmm. I do Nikio. Nikio is a great technique on the ground, especially on your back. People have a grip and you just grab their hand and do Nikio and it's not hard. It's really not. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's interesting you say that about demos because I, I feel much the same way in that. And it's occurred to me as I see demos, like really what they are is commercials they are aikido's version of of a media exposure for all right here's what aikido is well when you look at how the how an audience would view that what are they comparing it to they'll compare it mm -hmm. to one of two things either the movies you know like you'll see a seagal movie or or right. some other movie or tv show that's got aikido portrayed in it which it's basically like a multi-million dollar commercial. They've got paid stunt people, choreographers. They will spend days scripting the, scripting the thing out that will get yeah. high level martial artists to be the attackers. Cause you know, it's, you know, they can, they, they can make a 90 pound scrawny actress look like an ass kicker because they're such oh, good yeah. attackers, you know, extraordinary. They have the camera work. They've got the lighting. They've got the dramatic music, the whole Hollywood wrapped up in a package with a nice shiny bow on the top. Like right. that's what we're comparing to. Right. Of course, it's going to look lackluster to that. You're not, you know, when you're comparing John Wick to you know, an Aikidoist on a mat who probably put 10 minutes worth of preparation into, into their demo, of course, it's not going to look 
as good, you know, to the average person. Right. When I was just thinking John Wick too, that was yeah. popping up there. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I remember seeing a couple of years ago, there was a video of a, the Marine Corps did a demonstration of their martial art. I'm like, oh, this should be cool. You know, I had a tent mm -hmm. out there and they had the pit with the rubber thing in there so they could slam each other down. You know, they were rubber chips or something. And of course they're in their boots and, yeah. and the whole thing. And, and they're going through this demo and I'm like, boy, does this look fake? Oh my God. You know, because it was scripted and, and they're trying to, trying to bring out and show what's happening you know, so that the eye can process it. But I'm like, the Marine Corps martial art is legit. There is there that mm -hmm. is made to do a certain job and it does it very well. So it's not the art, it's how it's being shown. And I think that that's, right. um, you know, that that <clears throat> it's something to take in mind when you know, you get to that, like the video you were talking about of the parlor trick thing, like, right. if that's the part you show, it's not going to be a compelling attraction and youtube is an, an entertainment platform i mean i try to use it and other people try to use it for education and to communicate <clears throat> but the people that are clicking through there they're looking to be entertained and if whatever you show is not going to entertain them they're going to do one of two things they're not going to watch it or they're going to blast you for how, how dare you this is stupid this isn't entertaining this is the dumbest thing i've ever seen right so it's kind of a a no-win platform to go into yeah. trying to say i'm going to impress you with with what i show you and and recently i think in the last couple of months i've seen a few like i don't know if they're trailers or like mini movies uh done by an aikido group and i want to say they're probably out of eastern europe somewhere or, or something like that where they do like these little vignettes of a guy walking down the street or he gets on a bus and these thugs come up and start pushing him and he starts doing you know they, right you can tell like that's still a commercial. Maybe it doesn't have the, the Hollywood budget to it, but it's more like the Hollywood than it is, you know, than it is like the yeah. average uh, on the mat demo. So I, right. I applaud them for it. And I wonder if it's, it's going to generate some interest, but I think people can see that, see that it's kind of just been dressed up a little bit. Um, I know I certainly can, but I know what I'm looking for in terms of, you know, I can spot spontaneous, conflict and, and violence versus something that's scripted. I can, right. I can pretty much that, you know? um, yeah. <laughs> and it's for that reason, I, I've never really gotten into martial art movies just for martial arts. You know, I liked some of the ones back in the eighties uh, that didn't focus a lot on the fighting. It was a little part of it, but as they became more into the, you know, martial art orgy thing, uh, and I yeah. think what was it? Ip Man was one of the first ones that was just, it was like a fight scene, two thirds of the movie. <laughs> was, yeah. You know, that was <laughs> impressive. I mean, the, 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 uh, the actor that was in there, I mean, very impressive looking martial arts, but it's just more of, I don't know, it's almost like a fight yeah, kind fun. of thing. Sorry, you're cutting up a little bit there. I don't know if that might be me or you. <laughs> All right, uh, we have a connection problem. Brandon, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, there you're back. All right, had a little had a little okay. bit of a hiccup there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and this is where I give the like the UFCs and the MMA yeah. props um, because it's a actual venue where you can see people in live play live conflict you know in a fight showing what what works oh, did we lose you again right there we go no, i'm here okay good um yeah and i think the influence of the ufc and seeing live fights was like a, a kind of a breath of fresh air because the martial arts up until ufc came around generally were movies and where they can Everything mm -hmm. the presentation can be entirely controlled and you can be impressed by what you're supposed to be impressed by. And then the live element came in, um, you know, and this was before we could see a lot of surveillance videos of how real fights tend to go. Um, and I, I would say for anybody who's gets mm -hmm. into the MMA stuff or sport fighting a bit too much, I'd say, go watch a bunch of surveillance videos about how real fights go. And you can see that they don't look anything alike. 
Like there's a whole new realm no. of conflict there that, that is not included in the sports stuff. Um, right. So. Totally night and day. Totally. Yeah, it is. And including going to the ground, you know, again, mm -hmm. you can see how many do wind up in the, on the ground and if they do, how they do it. Like, how does it go? I mean, so many times you see people tackled into a booth, into a restaurant or, you know, it's, it's wild kind of how it, how things tend to go. Um, right. So it's, you know, you get a whole different level of, of adventure, of, a, of adventure when it <laughs> comes to sport right. versus, the, you know, real world stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's obviously environmental um, elements change the dynamic of, of a fight. Um, so yeah, like you said, if you're in a bar bunched up in a booth, that's going to be a different situation than flat out on the ground in the grass or something and mm -hmm. or standing and, and banging it out with someone. I mean, yep. I think more people are probably knocked out with, with fists than are actually fighting on the ground. Um, sure. So, yeah. And from what I've seen in, in real fights, getting their head knocked onto the ground as they fall or running their head into a door frame or, you know, something of that nature tends to be, the ambience can be more damaging than your opponent. Um, right. You know, that's very common too. And, yeah. and that, that's not to say that I don't, that I don't have any respect for sport fighters. I certainly do. They, they do an oh. amazing job in their realm. And, um, you know, I think that, that the, uh, I think they did a, vi a video where they had uh, like a group of MMA fighters that came to the Marine Corps training camp thing. And they, they had a ring put up and they brought the Marines into the MMA ring and uh, yeah. just, you know how they do. And the Marines just all got beat, you know, and then they took the MMA fighters yeah. out to the yeah. Marine Corps and they ran them through their little courses and the MMA fighters just got, you know, oh, totally overwhelmed. Um, so it's like, yeah, you can't look at any one as being the best and all the others are crap. It's, their tools make right, right. certain jobs. Um, and I suppose that makes it a little challenging as we as practitioners have to sort of define what, what it is we want from our art and then to make sure that we're not getting like too hyper-focused if you know, we, we want it to be able to cover different things. And I think if, if anything, groundwork is probably the first big hole that, that a lot of martial arts have that should be filled. Like to me, I don't see much excuse for not having a basic, how do you get back to your feet and how do you deal with being tackled, taken down and get back up again? I think every martial yeah. artist benefits from having that. You know, I, I often think, you know, how many times did wrestlers or, or good judo players that were good on the ground before the age of the internet and videos, how many times did they often take people down and dominate? Mm -hmm. It just wasn't put out there because nobody would know. I mean, no, either one, nobody would talk about it because they were embarrassed or two, mm -hmm. you don't know because it's not out there in the, the internet. There's no video. I mean, so I think it's been around. It's just now being spotlighted. And I, I often hear quotes of O-sensei saying Nikito's ever evolving. Well, since he passed it, I don't think it's evolved. I think it's stagnated. Yeah. And that's, that is truly. Yeah. It's evolved, but not unfortunately. That's right. Yeah. It's devolved, de -evolved. you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's become something that it wasn't maybe in later life intended for him based on his age and his religious views and stuff like that. And I get that he was religious and he brought that out in his way. Sure. But I also think he told his students to express themselves in their way and to keep evolving. And I just see people emulate him. It's mm -hmm. it's like a recording, you know. Oh, since they did that, and now they're doing that, and that there's no change, right? And I don't think that's good for the art. I think there should always be some sort of evolution. I agree. And and one of the things that I've noticed that as a martial art tends to evolve, it seems to get narrower and narrower as time goes on, right? And I don't know if that's because if it does narrow like that, that then that art can claim solid ownership over what it does and, and its own right. brand mm -hmm. well unfortunately that although it's true that they can kind of claim that brand but unfortunately when you're making poor martial artists or ones that have have a narrow skill set 
you're not really creating a legacy of of a body of work that that justifies that art i mean if you're you know i guess to, if we narrow down like what would aikido be in 50 years if the only thing it ever practiced were wrist locks we didn't do anything except wrist locks that's it we'd be really good at them which people would respect us for wrist locks but as a general art the perception yeah. would be it's their one trick pony like can't do anything else um you know and, and i'd hate to see aikido get go keep going down that road where it just got narrower and narrower and uh you know i i view aikido as a broad art um not a not a hyper specialized one but i guess that's just my opinion you know are you there Sorry. yeah I, we had a little bit of a hiccup okay. but yeah go ahead okay <laughs> I, I think you cut out i got some of that i don't think okay I got yeah it's basically I, I i view that aikido is a more of a broad art not not a hyper specialized one right yeah. right and I hate and, to see it keep going into more hyper specialization. Yeah, I, you know, where does it end? Um, mm -hmm. And what, where is it ultimately going to end up? I think um, I've been um, not necessarily in a syllabus like written down, but I've been putting things in from my my grappling, my ground grappling experiences mm -hmm. from both judo and jujitsu. Um, trying to incorporate it into Aikido. Okay, so we get somebody on the ground, now what? And, and not necessarily a pin or a break or something, but maybe a control situation, certain things. And I think if we, I, I, I don't want to say add, because again, I, I still have a feeling that there is some something in history um, where O Sensei did more of a Neiwaza um, thing. But again, his students weren't Aikido students per se. They had other arts, you know, right. judo um, comes to mind that a lot of judo people came to him. Mm -hmm. So they, the other people had skills mm -hmm. um, already in certain areas and they just went to him and learned Aiki. Sure. Whether it's Aikido, Aikido, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, the, I think history would show that there's probably more to it than we know. And I'm, and the, it's unfortunate we lost Stanley Brannon, yeah. who was an awesome researcher. Um, you know, he was digging up a lot of stuff and it's unfortunate because right. I think you, you probably could have found more. Mm -hmm. um, well, and, and it's quite possible that, that uh, for example, the Gracies and, and other people that really focused on that aspect probably rediscovered things that were part of a ground grappling work that had kind of been forgotten or or whatnot i i tend to think that mm -hmm. in terms of hand-to-hand -hand combat there's really nothing new under the sun at very best you can right. just rediscover something that is probably thousands of years old yeah. yeah yeah there's some stuff that you could say is new but most of it's just new to you or new to me um right it's still a wondrous journey to find those things it's really great when you absolutely when you come yeah. into them they're fantastic um but yeah, I think in terms of that, that ground, like we're talking about the, the difference between a sport application and a, like a real world application, at least for me, I'm not a police officer, but I can view that. And I've had to do this before I've had to restrain somebody just to keep them from causing any harm. And so that would be very similar to an application mm -hmm. where I need to control them. I am not necessarily mm -hmm. going to get them into a submission situation where I'm going to break something of their, you know, break their body because I'm trying to submit them, but I do want to control them. And, um, you know, I, I really like the, the wrestling right. approach. I like having my weight on top of somebody, especially if they're, they're not trained, you put weight on somebody and it just take, it take, they gas out right away. You know, they panic. They're very easy to control. It's easy for me to get back to my feet. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I like that that type of approach, but it's certainly not the only way. There's there's many different ways to do it, and um, you know I would encourage anybody to. And this might be a bit of a challenge: is finding somebody to guide you in in pursuing learning some grappling in a way that is not sport specific, but more tuned to you know what would a person need to know 
to be comfortable that nobody can pin them down or hold them down. They can get up if they have to and, and get out. Um, but it's worth right. it. It's, it's so worth that time. It, it's, you learn so much about martial arts in general. You learn about yourself, your body will like it. It's, it's a great workout. Um, you know, it's, I think it's a lot of fun. It's Absolutely. not easy. It it's is. not easy. No. It is a no. lot of fun. Um, and things that are easy don't tend to be as much of a benefit as, as the things that you do that are harder. Right. So, you know. There's a sense of accomplishment and you, I found that I've really understood my body a lot better mm -hmm. in these past several years doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu than anything else I've even done, even with judo. I, I, this is a different movement set and a different way of using my body mm -hmm. that I found that I really liked because I didn't know that I could do certain things. Mm -hmm. And I think people would really be amazed at what they're capable of doing. Sure. So. You know, and I've, the parallels that I've found too, because a lot of people will say, well, God, it's so different. It looks so different than what, what we do from standing or whatever. But I've noticed so many parallels, hip mobility. If you have mm -hmm. hip mobility, you can, and that, I mean, that's what we do standing, right? Is we use yeah. our feet and legs to move our body and reorient uh, to our opponent to control leverage, like all of the principles are there. You're just doing it at a different orientation. Right. You know? And now you get kind of a new one because you can pivot on the ground, but you have right. to, just like standing, you have to know where your head is. You know, if there's something within range of your head, you got to deal with that. Yep. And, and you use maneuvering in order to do it. So I've found more parallels than differences, even though the feels different because you're laying down or you're, you know, right. that sort of thing. And you've got weight on, well, yes. you know, it's, it's easy to move around on your feet when you don't have any weight on you. But again, that's easier. It's more challenging when you have that weight, but that's where you learn. And that's mm -hmm. where your body gets that, not just the conditioning, but the feeling of leverage, feeling of weight, being able to adapt and, and change position to know what you can move and what you can't and to use what you, what you have available. Um, and I equate that right to one of the you know, first lessons I learned in Aikido, which is, you know, somebody grabs a hold of your arm, they're controlling your arm, but you have control of everything else. Like move the everything mm -hmm. else and that will right. start to change the, 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 that attack or that relationship, that connection right. principles the same, you know, somebody does a high ride, your, your legs are, are, and hips can move. That's an advantage to you. They're, they got the low ride. You can, you know, plant your feet and, and still shift and move your upper body. And, uh, you know, principles are all there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Good well, dynamic. Cool. Yeah, we've been going on quite a bit. Is there anything you would like to add to wrap up? No, no, I think we covered quite a bit. And uh, hopefully somebody can get something out of our, our ramblings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Um, you know, it saddens me when any martial artist berates or looks down on another art. And, right. and I think that that's, that's something that's, whether we, whether, uh, sport fighters are dismissed for being, you know, thugs, which I think is completely inappropriate. Right. Every, every sport fighter I've personally met has had sterling character. They are not thugs. These are not people that just enjoy fighting because, you know, they, they uh, want to hurt people. Um, they, they have in fact shown tremendous character. In fact, sometimes mm -hmm. greater character than tra traditional martial artists show in terms of, you know, they don't have that air of moral superiority. They tend to be pretty yeah. humble because they have been, you know, folded up and dominated on a weekly basis. <laughs> and, and that's, that does build that character. It, it builds a humility in you. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that that's, it's something, it'd be nice if, if there were a better relationship, every direction, both to Aikido and from Aikido to other arts. And yeah. Other on arts. that point too, I think I, and I hate saying this because I love Aikido. I really, really do. But in my personal observations and experiences, the people I've met in jujitsu across the board have been very nice and kind and friendly. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a, a difference in Aikido. I've been to seminars and all sorts of different places and there's an ego, there's a, almost a superiority complex of sorts mm -hmm. from a lot of them and some I've dealt with directly and for no other reason than they just think they're better. 
And I don't understand that. I, I, I think you should be humble. I think you should accept differences of opinions. You know, one way is not the right way. Um, and I know that. And I, I, I fall into the category sometimes like, oh, I, I wouldn't have done that. But then again, I'm not everybody else. They, they all have their own way of doing things. But it just seems to me that generally speaking, uh, there is a lot more ego and, and attitude from Aikido people that I've seen anywhere. In no, I, I, I would have to say that that's, that observation is pretty accurate. And I would say it covers almost every art that works entirely in the theoretical realm. Right. The ones that do not have any kind of a live play where you can experience failure when you make a mistake. Um, mm. That's that process itself is humbling. And, and, I hate it when that is when the term competition is used to describe that because of, you know, sensei's quote about not wanting competition in Aikido and who knows whether he meant he didn't want it a sport or didn't want to have actually, you know, live exchange, who knows, who knows exactly what it is. Um, But the idea that you have somebody actively trying to dominate you and you prove that you can stop that from happening. Mm-hmm. effectively like to me that is that is the ultimate goal of what technique training or kata training or or precision you know training precision of technique all that training is leading leads to that that destination of you know it's go time somebody's trying to trying to take you out can you put a stop to it right and do it in a way that you've protected yourself or you've protected others um, and without testing that out how do you ever know and if you yeah. don't know, and you think you know, now that leads to arrogance, and that leads yeah, to absolutely. delusion. Um, yeah. And that's, I think, just something we need to guard against and figure out a way to actually include that part in there. I don't think Aikido needs to become a sport. I don't, uh, I must admit, I don't think the, the Shotokan competition tournaments format, uh, that tournament format they have, does it not make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that that training uh, shouldn't include that active element. And right. just this last week, I sort of had this revelation that, you know, the people that I know that do violence, that I shouldn't say do violence, that have violence as part of their profession, police officers, that sort of thing, they don't need a sport tournament to go to, to sharpen their skills, to keep them right. competent. They do not require that or do it. Uh, neither do the Marines. Right. So, um, you know, it's not necessary, but there is a necessary component that, to training that needs to be in there to make sure that people know what they can do when it comes time. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, very cool. Um, any last words and then we'll kind of wrap things up. No, thanks for having me. I could talk for a few more hours on the, on all this, you know, um, you know, if, if there was anything about this podcast, I love is just to be able to sit down and, and kind of geek out on Aikido, martial arts, and and, yeah. and to learn about this because I love learning from from you, from everybody I've had on the show. It's just a great way to to gain more insight. So I thank you very much for for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You bet, Brandon. And I guess we'll be talking to you real soon. Okay. Have a good day, guys. Thanks. You bet. Take care. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Stay tuned for more episodes. I've got some great stuff on the way very soon. In the meantime, enjoy your training.